Welcome everyone to this HAI Weekly Seminar with Karen Lui today as our speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce Karen. Karen Lui is an associate professor in the computer science department at Stanford University. And prior to joining Stanford, um, Karen was a faculty member at the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech. She received her PhD degree in computer science from the University of Washington. And uh, Karen's research interests are in, the computer graphic, uh, are in computer graphics and robotics, including physics-based animation, character animation, optimal control, reinforcement learning, and computational biomechanics. She developed computational approaches to modeling realistic and natural human movements, learning complex control policies for humanoids and assistive robots, and advancing fundamental numerical simulation and optimal control algorithms. The algorithms and software developed in her lab have fostered interdisciplinary collaboration with researchers in robotics, computer graphics, and mechanical engineering, biomechanics, neuroscience, and biology. Um, Karen has received the National Science Foundation Career Award, an Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship, and was named a young investigator under 35 by Technology Review. And in 2012, Louis received the ACM SIGGRAPH Significant New Researcher Award for her contributions in the field of computer graphics. So it's my pleasure to welcome Karen today to the seminar. And uh, she's going to talk on the new role of physics simulation in AI. And was that Karen? Uh, oh, uh, one more thing I wanted to mention to all of you. Please um, feel free to ask questions through the Slido interface. So if you scan this QR code uh, on, uh, that is currently on the slide, uh, you get to the Slido interface and feel free to submit questions there. And after Karen um, uh, is done with her talk, I, uh, we will have a Q&A session uh, also based on the question that you submitted. And uh, I believe Celia is also going to uh, send a link through the chat that you could click alternatively if you don't, if you can't scan the QR code right now. All right. So with that, Karen, please take it away. Thanks, Jeanette. Thanks for the great introduction. Um, let me share my screen. All right. Does it look good? Looks great. All right. Well, um, I just realized that it's not a great idea to give an AI talk right before NeuroRips deadline. So I really appreciate all of you coming to my talk today. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the new role of physics simulation in AI. Um, physics simulation has always been a good friend to scientists and engineers, but um, its importance has been really drastically elevated in the recent years due to the rise of deep learning. It all starts with this desire to build this AI-enabled robots that operate in a dynamic and unstructured environment and even interact with humans. And AI has a promise to endow a new generation of robots with this mobility and, and decision-making skills. But unlike images and text, um, acquiring robot training data requires careful instrumentation in physics, in physical experiments, which can be challenging and risky to the robots and sometimes even to the exp experimenters. And for some and many physical tasks, the sheer quantity of a training data needed for the learning algorithm is simply in impossible, infeasible to acquire in the real world. On the other hand, physics simulation can provide a safe and inexpensive virtual playground for robots to acquire physical skills and even learn from mistakes. Simulation also allows engineers to rapid prototype different designs of the robots without the need to first build this, uh, the physical uh, system in the real world. And various virtual environments can be easily created in simulation so that robots can, can gain experiences with a wider range of scenarios. And finally, simulation can easily scale up to produce training data as, as much as needed at a low cost. But here's a problem. Control policy learned entirely in simulation and usually fail when deployed on the real hardware. This is a challenge, in, challenge known as the sim to real gap. Most of the robot research, researchers attempt to cross the sim to real gap by innovating better control policy for the robots. But here we wonder if we can achieve the same goal by innovating better simulation techniques. And speaking of the better simulation techniques, 
we know who we should be talking to, right? The computer animation researchers can produce ultra realistic visualization of phys physical phenomena, such as this plate of soba noodles swimming in this way too much oyster sauce, like my mom would say. But the simulator today cannot predict the particular scene in the real world, such as this particular robot manipulating this particular pot to make this particular pasta sauce, because we don't know how to build an accurate model for complex interplay of multiple physical regimes in the real world at the level we can simulate it. Likewise, we can simulate virtual humans to perform complex motor skills that looks very compelling. But when it comes to predict the movement of a particular person interacting with the real world, we don't know, we have no clue whether the simulator in, we have in any way reflecting the reality. And this example is even more challenging than the, the soba noodle because we need to simulate both the mechanics of a human body and its control. Simply put, the simulation today is not uh, very effective. On one hand, we have a lot of models that can create some phenomena, but they are not good for predicting a specific real world environment. On the other hand, we can collect a lot of data from the real world and, and, and perhaps we can build a data-driven model, but it's not going to generalize to the extent that our physics model can. So what is the principal methodology to integrate data with the physical models? Ideally, we would love to have a customizable physics engine that only takes a small amount of the real world data from the environment of interest and use this physics engine to train policy that can cross the centurial gap. What is the physics engine that I've been talking about anyways? At its heart is in, is in ordinary differential equations and an integrator that maps the current state x under the force u to the next state xt plus one. In the next time step, the next day will become the current state and the simulation process repeats. All right. How do we utilize you know, data given such a physics framework? An obvious place we can inject the influence of the data is the simulation parameters mu. These could be any parameters involving the simulation, such as geometry of the agent or coefficient of the friction of the surface. And one common way to do this is called system identification. We can execute the system in the real world to collect the data, and then we optimize the parameters mu to fit the data. This works when we have only a small number of mu to identify, but that's not true you know, for, for a complex real world scene. And there are many other issues with system ID, a system identification approach, which I will talk about later. On the other hand, recent advances in machine learning open the possibilities of using a large amount of measured data to replace physics models with the pure data-driven models. But we don't really have a lot of faith in these models today if they have to operate outside of distribution of training data which is very likely to happen for a dynamic system executing for a long period of time with a lot of external perturbation. So between these two extreme approaches, there should exist many other ways to integrate data with models such that they can be truly complementary instead of overriding each other's strengths. To this end, we need to have a more complete picture of the physics engine. And then we can identify the potential components in this framework to, to inject influence of data. So we know that most physics simulation for robotic application involves contact with the environment. And contacts need to be handled as constraints enforced by contact forces, FC, which will be included as part of the external forces in the simulation. We also have boundary on the state space and action space that define the range of emotion and actuation capability of the robots. And to enforce these boundaries, we also need to compute the, uh, the, the, the constraint force lambda and include them in the simulation. Okay, so now our simulation framework looks much more complex. And in fact, we typically end up solving a differential algebraic equation rather than the simple ODE. But this also means that there might be a lot more opportunity to learn from the data. So today I will talk about three different approaches to integrate learning and data in this physical simulation framework. So first let's look at a more conventional way 
um, can we make model parameters more learnable? We start out with a conventional system identification. Here we come in the robot based on some arbitrary policy in the real world. You know, it doesn't need to work. We don't even care what that policy is. We just want to collect the stays and action trajectory, X bar and U bar. We also send the SAM commands to the virtual robots and simulate its motion. The simulated motion will be compared with the real world motion uh, in this loss function L. And our, our goal is to find a set of the model parameters mu to minimize the differences in the motion sequences. So here I put a lock on this policy we use to generate data, just to remind you that we're learning the, the values of mu, not the policy parameters. So here's the problem. Um, system identification makes a strong assumption that the system is parameterized by a set of the predefined parameters and the true model lies within the model class. In addition, the similarity metric based on the LP norm between simulated and real, uh, real world trajectories can be unrealistic. And finally, if the optimizer is gradient based, we need to make sure that the gradient of the loss function is differentiable through the physical equations all the way to the model parameters mu. And this is not usually the case when the task involves physical contacts with the environment. Okay, so these are the challenges we're facing. Let's look at the first one. To mitigate the first issue, we construct a hybrid simulator combining learnable neural networks and physics equations. We replace the manually defined constant parameters mu with a stay action dependent function. In this way, the hybrid, the hybrid simulator can balance between the expressiveness that comes with the data and the generalizability that comes with the physics model. So uh, we, can, we can then learn this, these parameters of the network phi um, using the real world data. Know that now we need to compute the gradients with respect to phi, which are the parameters of mu. Specifically, we replace two types of parameters that are hard to directly measure and the existing models are known to be just a poor approximation. That is the parameters in contact model, such as friction and restitution coefficients and the parameters in the actuators. And since the contact and motor functions cover the external and internal forces in the equation of motion, there's a hope that they can potentially address the mismatch due to the unmodel un parameters. All right, so to solve the second issue, we propose to learn a loss function from data. Besides the fact that tuning this L L LP norm loss function is difficult, we have a unique challenge related to trajectory matching. Since model error quickly propagates in sensitive tasks like local motion, it is very difficult to pair trajectories from different dynamics domain. And the problem is exacerbated by, by different lengths in the trajectory, like, you know, which happens all the time when you have a local motion uh, scenario when the system is unstable and sensitive to initial conditions. So we're going to take a different approach. We're going to take the approach of adversarial learning for this task. General adversarial networks scans are initially used to generate fake images that, are, that share the same distribution with a small number of real, uh, real images. In our case, we will train a discriminator to differentiate, to differentiate whether a sequence is from the real world trajectories or um, from the simulated ones. And at the same time, we will train the hybrid simulator serving as a generator to generate simulated trajectories within the same distribution of real-world trajectories. Um, be, be because scan matches the entire distribution of trajectories rather than each pair of trajectories. It solves our one-to-one -one trajectory you know, pairing issue. All right. The final issue is that we would like to optimize the parameters fee. We could choose a gradient-free stochastic optimization method like CMAES, but those methods don't work well when the, the dimension of the variable is high. And here the variable phi, phi uh, you know, represents the, the ways of the neural network, which can be very high dimensional. On the other hand, we can use gradient-based method, um, but um, you know, gradient-based method requires the loss function uh, to be differentiable through the physical equation. And as I said earlier, this is usually not the case when we have contact. So how do we, how do we handle this issue? 
we propose to formulate the neural network neural network part of this hybrid simulator as a deep reinforcement learning agent and use policy gradient method to train it. The physics equation together with the initial, uh, initial policy used for data collection are the environment now. So here, this part, uh, the, the, the red uh, neural network is our policy and the physics equation plus this blue uh, neural network is the environment. Um, and and um, the, the, with this reverse row of policy and environment, we no longer need to worry about gradients through the physical equation because the policy gradient method does not require the environment to be differentiable as long as the policy is differentiable and stochastic. Okay? So now the output of our policy, uh, you know, is, which, which is the simulation parameter mu, becomes an action in this reverse RL formulation. And the input becomes the state space. And the reward function is defined by the output of the discriminator, which is being optimized concurrently. In this way, the, the hybrid simulator will, will be trained to produce trajectory that for the discriminate, discriminator. So you can think that this hybrid simulator contains a policy inside of it that modulates the physical parameters in real time based on the state and control. All right, another benefit of training the simulator as an RL agent is that it is, it is optimized to match real trajectory over an extended period of time because it is trying to maximize the long-term reward, not just each time instance. To summarize uh, with the ideas of hybrid simulator, adversarial learning, and training simulator like an RL agent, we solve the, all these problems of the conventional system identification. All right, once this hybrid physics engine is learned, we can use it to train robot policies. Now we're going to fix the, uh, the, the simulator parameters fee and use normal RL techniques to learn the parameters of the policy theta. And once the new policy is trained, we will test the robot in the real world in a zero shot, zero shot fashion. So here's our evaluation. Unfortunately, we're not able to really test the result in the real world due to the pandemic. But here we create a two different simulator environments and pretend one of them is the real world and the other one is the simulator world. So in this example, we made one of the robot legs heavier in the real world, but this information is not known in the simulator environment. So we first collect a small amount of data from the real world using an arbitrary initial policy. And um, we then use our method to train this hybrid simulator once the hybrid simulator is identified, we train a new policy using this customized simulator in the virtual world. And finally, we test this new policy in the real world with a heavier leg, um, and, and the new policy was able to work. Here's another example. Uh, this time, the surface in the real world is made of elastic material, like a bouncy mattress. And the initial policy doesn't work because it was trained on a rigid surface. But the fail experiences we collected can be used to train our hybrid simulator. And once we learn a customized simulator, we train a new policy and test it on this bouncy mattress. This example is particularly interesting because our physics equations alone can only simulate rigid bodies. But now uh, the hybrid simulator can mimic the external forces due to the elastic materials without the need to simulate complex FEM models. All right, going back to our physics simulation framework, we have augmented a classical physics simulator with learnable state action dependent parameters. What's next? Well, next we are going to look for learning opportunities in state and action boundaries. The need to make the state and action boundaries learnable becomes more apparent when we bring in another layer of a complexity into the problem of Sintorio. That is, how do we tra transfer a policy that physically interacts with a person from the simulated world to the real world? So for example, if we were training a healthcare robot that assists the person to put on clothes, how can we make sure that the policy train on a virtual human will work on a real person and directly deploying this RL policy on the person is just not a wise thing to do. 
So we need to we need to have a better simulator for human so that a robot trained to assist a virtual human in simulation has a better chance to cross this centurial gap. Such a human simulator should realistically reflect the, per the person's range of emotion and dynamic capabilities. A naive way to define the range of emotion is to simply set some arbitrary upper bound and lower bound on, very, on, on every single degree of freedom of the human model. But after we collect the shoulders configurations from a real person and plot out the shoulder range of motion as the green area in the figure on the left, we can immediately see that the real human joint limits is much more complex than the conventional box constraints. The second challenge in modeling joint limits is, uh, is that the range of the angle varies depending on the position of the other joints. If I, um, I can bend my elbows almost 180 degree if my arm is in front of my body, but the range of motion for my, uh, for my elbow is a lot, a lot more restricted if I put my arms behind my back. All right, with these two observations, we redefine the upper and lower bounds as a function of the joint configuration. However, a more clean represent, representation is to use an implicit equation. So we define a function d to represent the boundary of a human range of motion. How do we learn such a function? Well, luckily, Michael Bloch's group at MPI has created a very comprehensive database of human poses, among many other great things they did. And this database provides the learning samples we need to learn the, this function d. And once the state-dependent boundary condition D is learned, we also need to figure out how to enforce it in the physics simulation process to ensure that the next day we integrate to is within the, bound the boundary. And this can be done by introducing a constraint force lambda and solve it using linear complementarity conditions. And the fact that D is represented as a neural ne network makes com computing this uh, Jacobian very efficient. So let's compare the simulation results. Here we simulate two completely passive human agents under gravity. The one on the right has the, uh, the standard box constraints on the joints, and the one on the left uses the learned joint limits. So without any active internal control forces, the joint limits alone already gives the agent on the left a more human-like behavior. The simulation uh, in this example has no gravity in the scene, and the human agent is given an initial pull from the arm, and the agent with our data-driven um, joint limits result in much more realistic poses. In addition to dynamic applications, we can also utilize the gradient of the neural networks to solve inverse kinematics problems, uh, where solutions are confined in the set of a valid human poses. And in addition, we observe that our joint limits constraints can mitigate the issue of self-collision because many of those self-penetrating poses are not presented in the database, which we learn our, uh, our, our range, our, uh, our implicit function D from. So now we know how to model humans' range of emotion better. What about the dynamic capability of the humans? Simulating a virtual human with realistic capability to accelerate their bodies also plays an important role in training and assisted robots. Specifically, what are the joint torque limits that uh, reflect the, the realistic capabilities of a human musculoskeletal system? It turns out that just using conventional box constraint like what we usually do to enforce joint torque limits is also not a, a really good idea. Here's a motivating example. If I'm defending myself against someone bigger than me, one effective strategy is to put my opponent's arm behind his back because anyone in that position can barely exert large, any torque. And this leads to our first observation that joint torque limits should be state dependent, depending on both joint position and velocity. Another fact about our muscular system is that each of our muscles spans multiple joints and there are multiple muscles exerting torques around the same joint. And this leads to our second observation that torque limits also depend on current torques at other joints. So let's make this more concrete. We start out with the conventional box-like constraints for joint torques, but with our first observation that the torque limit should instead be function, a function of your joint states 
And in addition, by our second observation, torques also depend on each other. Therefore, we model a, the, the torque limits as an implicit function of Q, DQ, and tau. And our hope is that this function can incorporate muscle capabilities, but only use the information available in joint torque space. So how do we analytically evaluate C? We define C being negative one if there exists a valid muscle activation pattern such that it could produce the torque at the current pose. And we define C to be one if the current torque um, cannot be realized by muscles. And this function here denotes the forward muscle dynamics which maps act activate muscle activation at the current state to its corresponding torque. So in order to evaluate C, we have to solve in feasibility problems. Um, we could relax that to an optimization problem, but still um, evaluating C is very costly. Um, and especially if you want to put this function C at the inner loop of an optimal control problem. So perhaps we can build a model to approximate the, optimi the, the, the optimization process, this um, uh, feasibility problem solving process. Perhaps um, uh, you know, a neural network can do the job. And this will allow us to quickly figure out whether a proposed joint torque is human realizable or not. So how do we collect uh, training data to train such a model? And turn out we can utilize this wonderful set of muscle modeling and simulating tools called OpenSim, also developed at Stanford. And with OpenSim, we can solve the optimization problem using anatomically accurate human muscle models. And we utilize OpenSim to provide um, soft optimization instances as training data. We sample and solve 1 million such optimizations uniformly distributed in the joint space. So we are not biased to specific tasks. We could even use more samples, as many as we want, because you know, offline simulation is essentially free. So this learned joint torque bounds can be directly used in an optimal control problem. Here's a generic trajectory optimization that solves for a trajectory of the joint configuration Q and joint torque tau. We want to find Q and tau such that some objective function is minimized and subject to physics constraints and joint torque bounds, as well as joint configuration bounds. We can replace this constant torque limit with our task agnostic state dependent torque limit, uh, the, the function C. And this function is represented as a neural network, which means we can efficient, efficiently compute its value by V4 operation and compute the gradient by back propagation. In addition, we can also replace this box joint limits with a state dependent joint limits learned from the real human poses. So together we have a human simulator learned from biomechanically correct model and the real world data. So let's look at some examples. In this task, uh, the agent tries to optimize the, 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 the height, the jump, the vertical jump, the height of vertical jump. And using conventional joint motors, the character actually jump higher. But then we realize, you know, it turned out this green character, uh, the baseline character, hyperflex its ankle. So it has a longer, di longer distance to accelerate before uh, leaving the ground. However, this is impossible to achieve because the real human cannot apply large torque at this hyperflex uh, poses. Our R model correctly prevents the optimizer from exploiting the simplicity of the model without the need to simulate muscles and tendons. We also compare our methods to motion generated using complex muscles model. Our motion is very similar uh, qualitatively to that. But our torque space method uh, takes only 50% less computation time. The same torque limits function can be applied to other tasks, like uh, in this case, uh, the agents are trying to accelerate as much as possible before releasing the bar. And we observe the same unrealistic behavior with the conventional joint motors. Um, it exploits overbending poses to accelerate longer than so that it can fly longer. And comparing our, mo our, our motion to the one generated by the muscle model, um, you know, we see very similar behaviors, but our method is significant, significantly faster. Okay, so we have uh, added more learning opportunities in our physics engine by representing the state 
and action boundaries using two neural networks and, and, and learning their parameters from biomechanical data and real human data. All right, we still have one problem here. A learnable physics engine is useless if we don't know how to train the parameters efficiently. We could always use some generic gradient-free optimizers like CMAES I mentioned earlier, but they do not scale well when the number of learnable parameters is large. It would be really great if this entire simulation cycle is differentiable. So we have the flexibility to learn any part of this physical engine efficiently. It turned out that most of the physics engine is, is already differentiable. Like this part is differentiable, integrators differentiable, state action boundaries are different, differentiable. The only component that is not naively differentiable is the, is the contact handling. Um, so how do we make this part also differentiable? Well, how is a contact force computed? Let's start with that. We we'll start out with this dynamic equation in the generalized coordinates, F equals EMA. Well, um, uh, this is analogous to F equals EMA. It doesn't look like F equals EMA, but it is. Suppose we have two objects, A and B, colliding at, um, at, a, at a current time step. A contact force needs to be computed and added to the dynamic equations to make sure that the two bodies behave correctly after collision. So what is the correct contact behavior? Well, first, the objects shouldn't pass right through each other, right? And this means that the relative velocity after the collision should be non-negative. And second, we know that the contact force can only push, push the objects apart, not hold them together in the normal direction. And third, being a passive force, contact force FC, shouldn't do any work to inject energy to the system. It should only be non-zero when the two objects are still in contact. And as soon as the two objects are going to separate, the contact force should cease to exist. So there are other conditions due to friction force, um, but we will skip them in this talk. So we can consolidate these conditions into a few equations. The goal of the contact handling is to find contact force FC in the next velocity, F, uh, vt plus one, such that they satisfy these equations along with the dynamic equations. And this system um, of equation is called a linear complementarity program. All right, turn out that we can write down the next velocity v as a vt plus one as a linear function of the contact force with a, mat with a matrix A and a vector B defined by other terms in the physics equation. So now we can simplify this LCP by substituting V with this linear relation and only solve for uh, the contact force. And this gives us a, a concise description of LCP. It's a mapping from input A and B, input matrix A and vector B to the output uh, contact force FC, which is the contact force solution. If we embedded the LCP as a layer in the neural network, the four paths will be computing the contact force that satisfy the LCP. And our goal is to be able to um, compute the, uh, the gradients, um, compute the gradients of this layer, which is the gradient of a contact force at the solution with respect to the input matrix A and vector B. All right. So computer gradients of LCP is not easy, but there are a lot of uh, cool math developed in the last few years that could be helpful. From the prior work, we learned how to compute gradients of a quadratic program through its KKT conditions. And if we look at our LCP, it looks just like a KKT conditions for some QP, right? So we can directly use the same machinery to get gradients. But treating LCP as a generic KKT system requires solving a very large LP, which is not ideal. We noticed that this generic approach completely ignores the unique structures of our problem due to the contact physics. If we try to exploit our knowledge in physics, we can develop better algorithms to compute the gradients of LCP. We know each contact point can be in one of the following three states um, according to the LCP. So when the contact force is positive and the relative velocity is zero, we call it a clamping state because um, the objects will remain in contact in the next time step. When the relative velocity is positive and the contact force is zero, we call it separating because the object will be 
moving apart from each other in the next time step. And finally, when both relative velocity and contact force are zero, we call it a tie situation, okay? So if the no contact, con contact points are tied, LCP is actually strictly differentiable and the gradients can be analytically computed. So let's exclude this the tied case for now. So we can group the contact points into the clamping set and the separating set and we write the LCP as follows. Well, it seems we're making things worse, right? Because now we have more gradients terms to consider. But if we consider the conditions of a clamping and separating cases, we can significantly simplify the problem and speed up the gradient computation. Specifically, we know that the contact force for separating contact point is zero, the F, F, F sub S is zero, and the relative velocity for the clamping contact points also zero, so VC is zero. And these con conditions allow us to cancel off many terms in our equations. And essentially, uh, we can reduce the LCP to the following three linear equations. We can then re reason about each gradient term and found that most of those terms are also zero. So for example, this gradient term measures how solution FC changes with the change in the, the submatrix ASC. The relevant equation for this uh, gradient term is the third, uh, the third one shown in red. And according to that, a valid FC should map to a positive value on the y-axis. Now, if we perturb uh, ASC a little, we change the slope of the equation since, um, because it, you know, the, according to this, to this equation, and since the solution FC holds strictly in this inequality equation before, there's some non-zero room to wiggle the slope without violating the inequality. And this means that the same solution FC was still satisfied the inequality constraint. We don't need to change that uh, after you know, a little bit of change of, of, of uh, ASC. So therefore the gradients will be zero. And we make similar conclusion for another gradient term. Here, if we perturb BS, the solution FC will still satisfy the inequality constraint. So the gradient of FC with, with respect to BS is also zero. The only gradient terms that will, that will be non-zero are these two terms shown in red. In practice, changing changes to ACC and BC only happen because we are differentiate, differentiating with respect to uh, state of physics parameters. We will just use a scalar variable X to represent any arbitrary scalar quantity that affects ACC and BC. So we can then compute the gradient analytically and it turned out we still have to invert this matrix, but ACC, but this is just a sub matrix in the huge KKT system and computing that is much more efficient than you know, inverting the entire uh, system. So finally, we need to talk about the type case in fact, the tight case is the reason LCB is not naively differentiable. To see that, we can write down the linear relation of the relative velocity and the contact force for a tight contact point and, and plot out the relation in 2D. The current solution must lie in the origin because both velocity and the uh, contact force are zero. That's the, the condition of a tight case. As we add in infinite, infinitesimally small positive value to B tilde. We see that the current solution does not hold anymore and we need a positive velocity to balance the equation. This means that the, that the contact will switch from tight to, uh, to, to separating mode. Right? On the other hand, if we add an infinitesimally small negative value to B tilde, we will need a new solu solution with a positive contact force to satisfy LCP. And the contact in this case will immediately switch to uh, clamping mode. All right, so the gradients for the clamping and separating cases are both valid subgradients for tight contact points. So in practice, you can just pick one um, to switch to in your optimization. So the takeaway here is that, uh, but, but one thing important is in practice, encountering contact in the tight case is quite rare due to the numerical approximation. So the takeaway here is that given the solution, the LCB contact handling is almost naively differentiable if we can live with a subgradient case. 
All right, so with this differentiable contact handling procedure, we now have a feature complete and very fast differentiable physics engine. Here are some results of a solving optimal control problem using gradient base optimizer. All the examples we present here uh, require contact states to change, and this type of a problem is difficult to solve using gradient based optimizer methods in the past. We also open source our differentiable physics engine, so anyone can just pip install it and play with it. There's a lot of physics engines out there being used by researchers in graphics, in robotics. We don't really want to create a new one just for its differentiability. Instead, we make an existing fully functional physics engine differentiable without modifying its you know, in internal con constraint handling and without sacrificing the speed. Finally, we can make our learnable physics framework completely differentiable, which allows every parameters in this physics engine to be different, efficiently learned from data. All right, so in the last few, few, in the last few minutes I have, I would like to show some current progress of our work on transfer policy that physically interacts with a person from simulated world to the real world. Um, when developing robots aware of a human in the scene, the simulation can play a crucial role both in terms of a perception and control. So let's first talk about human aware robot sensing. A large body of work in robotics and computer vision has focused on vision perception, but there are many other modalities of a perception playing critical roles in human robot interaction. So for example, human caregivers heavily rely on haptic sensing to provide physical assistance. Can we teach our robots to understand how a person feels when it, when it, when it applies a forceful action on the person? So in this project, we want to be able to estimate exactly that, what a human feels from the force applied at any factor of the robot when the robot assists the human to put on clothes. On the right, uh, we are showing um, a simulation of the person's arm, arm and what the robot thinks that the force being applied to the human in real time. The type of haptic perception is particularly crucial when the vision perception is limited due to the, uh, the occlusion of clothes. Specifically, we learn an estimator model that estimates the current force map from the history of force torque sen sensor readings at any factor of the robot. And all the training data here are provided by simulator. And to test our estimator, we command the robots any factor to follow a random trajectory on the left. Um, and and, and th that's the, that, that's the, uh, the any factor you're seeing. Um, the, the pressure on the arm predicted by, and also the, the color, colorful thing is the, uh, the pressure map uh, the robot predict on the human's limb. Uh, on the right, you see the ground truth obtained through the call simulator. And basically all the robots know are these uh, force vectors they can sense, apply on its hand. And from there, the robot is able to imagine the pressure force apply on the human's arm. In another project, we are interested in estimating 3D posts when a person is resting on bed under blankets. So people spend roughly one third of their lives resting on bed. So 3D human pose and shape estimation for, for this particular activity would have a lot of uh, uh, implication, right? healthcare applications such as bed sore management, sleep studies, or um, you know, remote patient monitoring. Um, but line of sight perception like a camera is complicated because of occlusion from bedding. And so one idea we have is to use pressure sensing mats. In this project, we introduce a data-driven method to infer 3D posts from a pressure image recorded by pressure mattress bed pad. But collection, co co collecting this type of the training data is not easy. So alternatively, we could use simulated data to train the model. We model the pressure sensing pad and underlying matches as a collection of the particles and carefully identify the coefficients of the simulator based on the, the readings from the real pressure sensing pads. And we use the, uh, our customized physics simulator to synthesize pressure images and create a large set of label training data. The simulation process is essentially free and allow us to cover a wide, range, wide distribution of human body types. And here we show that the model train with the synthetic pressure images 
uh, but we tested it with the real pressure images produced by real people lying on a mattress. And our model is able to pre predict the 3D pose in body shapes reasonably well. Robot perception is crucial, but at the end of the day, what matter is whether we can develop a robot policy that takes advantage of those rich input perception and make the um, e effective decision. So since the human and the robots need to learn to collaborate with each other to achieve a task, we take a co-optimization approach to, um, to simultaneously train the control policy for the humans and the robot. And the actions robot and the humans produce will be tested simultaneous in, simultaneously in the shared environment. Um, one nice thing about training policy and simulation is that we can train with a variety of environments in parallel. Right? If we think a human is a source of a variation in the environment, that means we can train a policy against a wide range of a population simultaneously. The robot will be trained to um, robustly serve not just one particular human model, but the, the, the continuous range of humans who all attempt to do their best to achieve the task with the, within their capabilities. And ultimately, we are, uh, we are co-training an adaptive policy for the human and a robust policy for the, uh, for the robot. So here we visualize the learn robot policy in um, yeah, interacting with a range of a different human behaviors. Compared to the normal humans, a human with a weaker arm changes the action of the robot. It is subtle, but you can see that the same robot policy end up doing more for the human when, when, when it addresses a weaker person. And similarly, when, when the um, human has, uh, has less precise uh, precision and more noisy in their movement, more noise in their movement um, or limited joint range of motion, the same robot policy is still able to achieve the task. And after training a policy in simulation, we have successfully deployed an RL trained policy on a real robot, PR2, dressing another robot, which follows uh, the, 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 the virtual humans policy. The robot-robot interaction scenario clearly is just an intermediate step towards serving the real humans. Uh, but on the on the, the step three you're seeing is a we have oh, we have achieved assistive dressing on the real user with disability using a model predictive control uh, style policy. So the the, the one on uh, in the real world is not quite an RL policy yet. And here is another example of apply our MPC controller along with the haptic sensing um, on a user with disability. We also introduced a capacitive sensor here, which I didn't include in this talk. Uh, you can see during dressing, it's very often that substantial parts of the humans are visually occluded, um, but our haptic sensing can inform the controller to constantly adapt it to our movement. Beyond dressing, we extend the simulation environment to train robots uh, for other activities of daily living, such as drinking, bed, uh, bed bathing, limb manipulation, and feeding. We develop an open source software called Assistive Gen, which is designed to produce, uh, to provide training environments for physical human robot interaction and robot systems. And hopefully this open source can facilitate more follow on research in the, this very exciting domain of assistive robotics. And here's a final example I'd like to show. This is a real robot using a wet washcloth to wipe a blue powder off a person's body. Um, with this uh, last demo, I would uh, I'll end my talk here and be happy to take any questions you have. Thank you so much, Karen. This was a really great talk with many very complex um, simulation tasks, but also uh, executions on the real robot. This was really exciting to see. Um, yeah, thank you very much. We have like um, time for questions. Uh, I just want to make everyone aware that in the chat, um, you can find a link to Slido. And if you want, there are already quite a few questions, but you can still submit questions uh, that I can go through, or you can upvote uh, questions that are already posed by, posted by others. Um, all right. So uh, Karen, so there are like a bunch of questions, like one I've already kind I'm of sorry, replied. Uh yeah. yeah, before you go, should I stop sharing? What do you think? Uh, I actually don't see your slides anymore. 
um, oh, okay. for some reason. Maybe okay. this is uh, actually Celia controlling this. Yeah, maybe yeah. stop sharing. Um, yeah, so um, the, the first question I've got the most upwards is, if you, is your code available? And uh, I already pointed people to your webpage. There is like for some of the papers, you have like a code link there and I'm sure you can find Dart uh, and everything yes. there you have it yes. on your slide. I, yes, the, most of the codes are available, especially the physics engines that we designed. It was, it, you know, from day one, there was uh, the design with the intention that we want to share the code. Um, and uh, yeah, you can probably find it, just type it in Dart or, or Nimble. Nimble, yeah. Physics engine. Nimble yeah. physics, I think that's uh, that's probably the, the word you should search for. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, so please uh, all go ahead. And if you want to play with this differentiable physics engine or with Dart, just go ahead. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I really like that uh, kind of overview framework uh, that you showed us for the hybrid uh, simulator uh, and also how you trained that uh, simulator. So and I was wondering, uh, actually, uh, you said that this data collection policy that you used at the very beginning was kind of like uh, you could use whatever you wanted. Um, but I was wondering, like, is there any sensitivity sensitivity to that uh, at all, or is it really yeah. does it not matter? I, I think I need to backtrack a bit. <laughs> Probably, in, if you, there is a, cat, a a class of the uh, you know policies you would not want to use. For example, if it, your policy is just lying on the, on the ground doing nothing, right? So you know, apparently there will be those uh, pathological cases you want to avoid. But in general, uh, we were you know the, we we didn't really spend any time designing that policy, which is some, uh, you know, you could track some trajectories. We just want to collect some data that has interaction with the ground because we want to identify the contact in the motors. Yeah. You have definitely had to exercise the motors okay. with, uh, you know, with the, with, with, the, with the impacts of the of contact forces. Yeah, and so uh, maybe related to that uh, particular part of your talk, there's a question from someone in the audience um, who comments on the stability issues of adversarial training using GANs? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, did you encounter any difficulty of actually training this with the scan approach, um, your entire framework? And like specifically, this was the loss function, I believe, or yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the reward. And how did yeah. you dealt? Uh, how did you deal with these issues? Yeah, so there's definitely stability, uh, you know, challenges with which is like any GAN uh, like um, training. Um, scheme. Um, and I think, uh, you know, my students can definitely answer that question better. But the, uh, you know, just in general, we will have to, um, you know, play with the, uh, so for example, the, uh, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 the uh, curriculum learning is a one way we could do it, right? So we could sort of start out with something that's, you know, uh, less, uh, less difficult. And then, you know, get in and train it iteratively to make it better. And then there's definitely the, the, the tuning of parameters and um, other other normal things. And and I don't know if my student actually did that, but then th there is some uh, work in the, um, I think just this year, you know, uh, trying to use a different type of loss function. Uh, so instead of instead of the, this, uh, uh, sig the, you know, sigmoid function, you could use a quadratic function as your, uh, uh, loss function to train your discriminator, and that could be helpful too. Um, yeah, so so just a whole bunch of the tricks that we 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 tried, um, you know, but nothing that was something that we invented. So mostly it's what other people have reported. And it's the short answer to answer to that is yes, it's not. Uh, you know, it's not like we are uh, we're immune from the stability issue. With again, we did try a few iterations. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so um, one question from uh, the audience from Mohan is um, comment or asking if um, uh, if you basically um, combined that later work where you had the differentiable context with that hybrid simulator that you had at the beginning. Uh, so um, yeah, so basically, right. yeah, yeah, I, 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 see, I see that. Yeah, right. So the. The, the first talk, uh, the first work I talk about, we're trying to uh, sidestep this differentiability issue using this uh, reverse reinforcement learning uh, trick, right? So we we'll basically try to think about your simulator is a policy. 
therefore, uh, and, and, and the, the, you know, the, 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 the physical equation is part of the environment and then you use policy gradients and then you can solve that differentiability issue. But we could certainly use differentiable physics engine to deal with that. And then the problem will solve. Well, I think will probably a good, uh, good next step to, yeah. to, to solve the problem without using the RL framework. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah. So do you think, uh, so maybe like uh, following up on this particular question here. Um, so, um, yes. So this person is asking also the corresponding nonlinear discontinuous dynamics are a function of multiple factors. And uh, do you think you captured all of them in this hybrid physics uh, simulator? Um, I don't know how to answer the question because the answer is probably not right because mm -hmm. I don't know how to prove that um and 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 so you know by default you know this is probably it's not something I can say we capture all of it um but I think just the fact that we um we we allowed um the we we, we sort of have a two we address two sources of the uh uh parameters that we're not certain about, like the, you know, the, the, the parameters that affects external forces and the parameters that affects internal forces. Um, and, and that give us a, you know, when you, when you compare it with the equation for motion, that give us some intuition that this could be a, 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 a potential way to uh, at least um, expand the expressiveness of a physics engine to capture some unmodeled uh, parameters. Right, because if you just think about equation of motion, there is just you know uh, external force and internal force. That's all, right? And um, in, in terms of external force, there would be just force that depends on state and, and state uh, and and, uh, um, and and action. So we have a, a, a neural network to uh, to address that. Um, and similarly for the you know internal force, we have something similar to that. So hopefully, is it generic enough? but I can never really say if we capture all of it. Um, one uh, question that I was also wondering is um, in your, um, one thing that you don't have in simulation is typically, or is typically not considered is uncertainty about the state actually. Mm -hmm. But in the real world, of course, you, you have uh, noise and proprioception of the robot, for example, and things like that. And uh, so uh, someone is asking, the Droha is asking, how do you account for uncertainty, for example, in the state input? Um, yeah, so is there, um, yeah, so does it matter? Or do you just do this maybe in hardware for compliance? Or how do you think about that? Yeah, so the I think the, uh, if you want to, if you want to address uncertainty in the state or in, or in the transition, in the you know transition function, it can be done, or you can even learn uh, to. You, I mean, you can definitely inject noise in there, um, and you can also learn this noise profile from data if you want to. Um, we didn't do that, uh, not because we don't think it's you know not necessary, right? Uh, it, it, it's sort of just something. There's so many things you can add to the to the to the system engine, and I think that you can certainly add that as well. Um, but we do have um, you know in doing training, you have you know if you use uh, now I'm talking about training the, uh, the the policy. We do have a you know stochasticity in the actions, right? So okay. yeah. you know, um, that would account for some stochastic uh, elements um, behavior, but um, you know, adding additional uh, stochastic behavior in the state transition could you know, be even more expressive. Yeah, um, so I am unfortunately think we're out of time uh, for this hour and there are so many questions that are now gonna go unanswered, unanswered actually. So I thank the audience a lot for uh, the participation for all these interesting questions that unfortunately I cannot uh, ask today. Um, but uh, thank you very much, Karen, for this super interesting talk. Um, I'm uh, really excited to see uh, all of this work and I'm really excited to see things also on the real robot soon when we're out of this pandemic. Um, and yeah, with that, um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, see you next time. <laughs>